back in Q4 of 2023, I purchased the SV225 manual Altaz mount from Zverboni. My unit was probably from one of the first production lots. Actually, I waited a few months for the product to launch and was not disappointed. It has been a solid and reliable telescope mount for doing visual astronomy many times over during the previous nine months. I even did a YouTube video product review of the SV225 extolling on its virtues. But recently I encountered some issues. The mount developed some backlash in the azimuth axis. A backlash is a slack in the mechanical gear mechanism that can be detected when you reverse directions of motion. In my case, turning the hand control rod in either direction had no resistance and no movement of the gears for about one quarter turn. But this only happened when you reverse the direction. That is backlash. It was annoying, but not a serious functional problem. However, during one subsequent night of viewing, the entire azimuth axis ceased to work mechanically. This included the brake mechanism. It would simply swivel freely on the azimuth axis. In this video, I will show you how to fix or reset the gear mechanism so that it functions like new again. I determined the nature of the problematic issue by disassembly of the mount and visual inspection of the internal gear system. Once I understood how it worked, which is very simple, then the fix or adjustments required were obvious. But let me emphasize here, you do not have to disassemble the mount to fix the backlash or loss of control problem. You do not have to take it apart. The adjustment screws are on the outside of the mount and accessible with the right tools. However, I thought it might be useful to share with you views of the inside of the mount in video to help you visualize exactly what the adjustments are actually doing. So let's get started. This is the base plate part of the SV225 mount. There are essentially four nicely laminated metal cast pieces here. From top to bottom, I will refer to them as the cover plate with the altitude extension arm, the tripod base plate, and a central gear core region. The gear core has a top core plate and a bottom core plate as well. I am going to disassemble these units by first removing the cover plate and the tripod base plate. The cover plate can be removed by unscrewing the four screws you see here. You will need a 3 16 inch Allen key for these four screw heads. Note underneath is the gear core unit. The top core plate has many screw holes. This allows you to shift the position of the cover plate and its altitude extension arm with relation to the fixed movement control rods if you desire to do that. But personally, I like the default factory set position the best. If you flip this gear core assembly over, you can see three more screws on the underside of the unit. Using the same 3 16th inch Allen wrench, it is possible to separate the tripod base plate from the bottom core plate too. In the center area of the bottom core plate, there is a large single bolt that holds the azimuth axis core together. Under this bolt is a metal washer and under that is a rubber gasket. I found that this bolt was attached securely, but not tightly. I think that the tension on this bolt might affect the tension on the maneuverability of the azimuth rotation. So be careful not to over tighten this bolt if you happen to remove it. Okay, when you remove the bolt and the top core plate, this is what is underneath on the flip side. The main thing you see is a metallic circular ring gear mechanism and a brass worm gear. It does not take much imagination to see how this works. Spinning the brass worm gear inches the rotation of the larger ring gear bit by bit. But notice here that when I turn the worm gear with my fingers, there is no rotation of the large ring gear. It does not work. On close inspection, the reason is obvious. The worm gear has pulled away from the ring gear and no contact is being made. This is a simple mechanical problem. There does not appear to be any broken parts so probably just a simple adjustment is required. Also, let me make a comment 
that the simplicity of this mechanism and the heft and quality of the metal components is impressive. It is very solidly built and there appears really to be nothing breakable. Next you can see here as I flip the top core plate on its side the protrusion of the brass worm gear out of the side of the housing. It actually sits within a brass guide housing but that guide housing has a peculiar asymmetric shape. The worm gear does not occupy a central position in the housing, but actually is skewed to one side. Perhaps you can now speculate what is the actual problem. The brass housing for the worm gear has slipped or twisted in such a way that it moved the position of the worm gear away from the edge of the large ring gear. So if we twist the brass housing in a way to push it closer, that should solve the problem. Note that the brass housing has two indentations on either side of the worm gear. These are simple dimples in the metal, not screws or anything like that. And these dimples are separated by exactly 9 millimeters of distance. So, to twist this worm gear housing, we need a spanner wrench. Something like that shown here on this slide. These are common wrenches used especially for disassembly of photography lenses. Spanner wrench or lens wrench are search terms you can use on Amazon if you do not own one. However, I must warn you, my spanner wrench and 90% of all such wrenches out there seem to have a minimum workable distance of 10 millimeters and greater. Unfortunately, our brass housing requires 9 millimeters of separation, so this wrench did not work in its normal assembled form like this. I actually had to hold both pencil-like units in one hand and put them into the holes and twist the brass housing without slipping. It is possible, but it was cumbersome and not easy. I found a few types of spanner wrenches on AliExpress, remember I live in Japan, that have a more narrow minimum distance capability and would be better suited for making these adjustments. Actually, I bought the unit on the bottom right for future use. It was the cheapest. At the making of this video, I am not certain if it is really suitable or not, since I just ordered it. But even if not, I guess I could still use it for making adjustments to my Rolex watch, right? Yeah, right. By the way, it turns out that the brass housing for the worm gear gets locked into place by the tiny Allen screws located just next to the protruding worm gear arms. In this photo, an Allen wrench is protruding from one of the sockets. So, in order to rotate the worm gear brass housing to make rotational adjustments to the worm gear, you know, to force it in or out, you may need to loosen the Allen screws and then tighten them back up again to hold a new position after you make the adjustments. In this video, I wanted to show you that when I adjusted the position of the worm gear to make contact with the large ring gear and turned the worm gear to test it, it worked in that it made contact but the turning seemed to primarily lift up the ring gear and not rotate it. This surprised and worried me a bit, but it was unwarranted. I realized the only reason this happened was because I did not have the other core plate attached to hold the circular ring gear into position. So I put the bottom core plate back on it, attached the central axis bolt snugly, but not overly excessive, and then overlaid the tripod base plate and secured it with the three Allen screws. Next, I could turn it over and reattach the top cover plate that included the Vixen clamping arm to completely reassemble the azimuth axis unit. When I put the unit back on the tripod and rotated the brass worm gear with the hand control rod, lo and behold, it worked. The smooth rotational movement of the azimuth axis was back. There was no backlash, and the locking mechanism worked fine also. Voila!
Okay, now notice in the photograph here, the brass worm gear housing and the indentations are accessible in the assembled unit. Just above that are the locking screws for holding the position of the worm gear housing. These are accessible on both sides in the assembled unit. So you can make these simple adjustments to eliminate backlash or fix any gear disengagement without opening up the center core gear area. But hopefully thanks to this video, you now understand how these adjustments actually affect the gear mechanism. I suspect, but have not verified, that the internal construction of the altitude axis of the SV-225 mount is exactly the same. It makes sense. It certainly has the same external adjustment features as you can see here, so if you have issues with that other axis, just follow the same procedure described here to reset it to factory new performance. It may be necessary, however, in this case, to remove the Vixen clamp in order to get access to the worm gear locking screws since they are hidden behind the clamp. But that can be done by simply unscrewing the six Allen screws that you see on the clamp. In conclusion, I think you can see that the construction and simplicity of this SV-225 device is quite impressive. As I said before, there appears to be nothing to break. It is solid and robust, made from durable materials including brass, and therefore it should last indefinitely. It's another quality product from Zviboni. But like all mechanical gear-based devices, the alignments may need to be adjusted every now and then to tune it up for optimal performance. In Yokohama, Japan, I'm JP Astro Guy. My name is Paul Cheesejo, and you have been watching Astrophotography Japan.